I'm Charles Evans, I, so I get the privilege of talking to you guys today about uh, hardware, something near and dear to my heart as an analytical chemist, and techniques uh, that we would use in metabolomics core. So um, just look at sort of the, uh, the, the outline, you've seen this slide a couple times already. Um, hardware and techniques, uh, you may see machines and techniques, this is a picky analytical chemist thing. Uh, we like to call our instruments instruments rather than machines, but they are machines. So whatever terms you want to use are fine. Um, so uh, this is where we fit in, uh, sort of at the at the uh, the middle of a metabolomics experiment, um, and maybe some of the things that you see the least of in terms of your actual interaction with the core lab. Um, you can decide uh, how interested you are in the instrumentation. It's helpful to have at least a basic background, and that's what the purpose of this talk is, so that you can understand uh, why we produce data the way that we do and, and what some of the caveats and what some of the strengths of the methods are. Um, so looking at, looking at this uh, in a sort of a, a more simplified uh, view, I wanted to take a moment to, to, to um, step back and clarify the difference between what you might think of what you do and what we do, and then the overlap between them. Um, so if we just look at a biological experiment, which is broken up into several parts on the previous slide, uh, sample preparation, which Lee talked about, instrumental analysis, and then the data analysis interpretation, which is itself many components. Um, the, the classical division of labor uh, in, in the core would be uh, that you are responsible for the biological experiment with, of course, uh, as has been emphasized many times, uh, the recommendation that you consult with us uh, in, in developing your biological experiment. But this is classically what you think of that you would do. Um, sample preparation mostly is transitioned over to us. You're going to submit the samples. There may be some aspects of sample preparation that you're responsible for. Um, uh, it may be something that's done entirely by the core lab. We certainly want you to know what happens to your samples after you get them and have input um, so that if, if you know something about the way your samples should be handled that we make the right decisions. Um, instrumental analysis is typically uh, more or less uh, entirely managed by the core lab. Um, so, so what I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about is not necessarily something that you have to worry about um, unless you want to. Uh, and, and to the extent that you, you should be at least basically familiar with, with instrumental uh, methods and techniques uh, so that you have an understanding of, uh, of why we do what we do. And then data analysis and interpretation is where we transition back from what we do as a core lab to, to, to what you do. And again, uh, there's many resources here that will help you in this process, and so we, we, we would really like to, uh, to think of it as all a, a com combined sort of, uh, you know, working together, uh, you and us, um, but this helps to keep it and clarify. So what we'll do today, um, uh, this, you, you notice instrumental analysis to, at the risk of being corny is a black box. Um, I, we're we're going to look inside that black box for a little while today and, and see what's inside. If you want to shut it at the end of this presentation, that's fine. If you want more information, we're here to let you know. Um, techniques, on the other hand, uh, really affect every step of, of, this, of this process, of this workflow. So um, I, I, we want to let you know uh, what the techniques are available so that when you design your experiment, and uh, you can use them. Uh, and then wherever you fall along the workflow, um, you can understand how it affects uh, our, our analysis and the results that you get. Okay, quick quick outline. Um, uh, hardware uh, or instrumentation, we'll talk about, and we'll do an uh, introduction to metabolomics hardware, um, what tools are needed. We'll look specifically at chromatography and mass spectrometry in a little bit more detail, and then we'll consider why you would want to put those two things together, um, why a hyphenated technique. Okay, and then we'll talk about techniques. So if, if that puts you to sleep or if you don't care, uh, you'll probably want to wake up for this part of the talk um, uh, where we talk about uh, the strategies that you'll use. Uh, Sue, Sue uh, Penarthur has already told you a good deal about targeted versus untargeted. We'll review a little bit of that. Um, we'll look at a workflow in some degree of detail. Um, uh, we'll look at uh, an example of metabolomics data, how we go from the raw output from, of an instrument uh, to useful information. To new tomorrow, we'll tell you, I'm sorry, this afternoon, we'll tell you more details on that. We'll just look at, at you know, from the lowest level uh, raw signal to, you know, the beginnings of useful information to new will take it a lot further. And then we'll spend some time talking about fluxomics, which is a specific technique that, um, that uh, some of you may be interested in, you may find yourself interested in a future date, and uh, it's different from the sort of obvious, uh, you know, try to measure the concentrations of as many metabolites as possible. Um, so we'll spend some time talking about that. Okay, hardware. So what tools do we need for metabolomics? Well, as Sue already told you, uh, 
the idea behind metabolomics is to study all or as close to all as you're interested in or as we're able to do um, small molecule, typically organic uh, metabolites present in a cell, tissue, or organism, uh, biofluid, any matrix that you're interested in, uh, in studying. So how are we going to tackle that challenge? Well, we need an analytical method which is sensitive because sometimes metabolites that we're interested in are present at very low concentrations. We need something that's quantitative. If you can't measure how much you've got, it, it's of very little to no value if you can say, yes, it's there, no, it's not there. So we need it to be quantitative. We need it to be universal. We need it to respond to a wide range of different compounds, the most polar, uh, the most uh, uh, hydrophobic lipid-like compound, uh, uh, regardless of whether it's charged or uncharged. We need something that can, can do it all. Um, and you know, no, no method is perfect, uh, but we want something that's as close as possible. And we wanted to be able to con uh, uh, detect as many compounds uh, simultaneously as we can. If you wanted to measure one compound, uh, for most compounds, there's nothing stopping you from going to Sigma Aldrich and buying a kit to measure lactate. Um, we want something that can do a better job uh, at looking at many things simultaneously to give you a broader profile view, whether that be all of a particular class of metabolite, um, like amino acids, or whether it be all of everything we can possibly measure if you don't really know where to start or you want as much information to, to frame your future more directed studies. So what can do that for us? Well, um, the instruments that we'll talk about are uh, liquid chromatography, uh, mass spec, gas chromatography, mass spec. Uh, you may hear referenced occasionally capillary electrophoresis mass spec. That's another um, technique that's occasionally used. It, it plays a lesser role. We won't cover it in today's presentation. Um, we can talk about that if you're interested. And NMR. Um, my talk won't cover NMR. That'll be the subject of the next presentation. Um, there's certainly advantages and disadvantages of each method, one over another. Um, the core will help you uh, determine uh, what's the best instrument to use. And uh, if you're not interested, we will select it for you and, and, uh, and produce data from that instrument. Um, OK, so let's talk chromatography. Um, chances are most of you have had at least some basic exposure to chromatography. Um, in, in your previous re research experience, but maybe not. Uh, so um, just a sort of a definition. Uh, chromatography is a means of separating and analyzing the components of a mixture. Typically in metabolomics, we're dealing with a pretty complex mixture. There's no sample, no biological sample uh, that contains just one compound that you're trying to measure. Or you, you could probably, uh, you'd have trouble coming up with such an example. So we have usually very complex mixtures that we deal with. And we want to take all of those components and separate them out so that we can address them individually and determine what they are and how much of them there, there is in your sample. And the way it works is it, uh, it, it uh, uses the differential affinity of those components, read metabolites, um, uh, between a stationary phase and a mobile phase. Um, uh, and the stationary phase is something which is going to absorb and then ultimately release your metabolite of interest uh, over the course of the analysis. And the mobile phase is something which flows through that stationary phase and provides the other option. So your metabolite can either be stuck to the stationary phase or moving with the mobile phase. So we'll, let's look at a visual example of that. Um, here's the components of a typical chromatographic analysis. You have your sample, what you want to separate. You have a column, uh, which is a, uh, a tubular container, typically. I'll show you some examples later today uh, in the demos. Um, uh, and in that column, there is a stationary phase. It could be a coating on the walls of that column. It could be uh, tiny particles packed inside that column uh, with a chemical functionality that gives it some property. Say it's very hydrophobic, or it's very hydrophilic, um, or it has a particular charge. And uh, then you have a mobile phase, which is some sort of gas or liquid that's flowing through this stationary phase at a, con uh, at a steady, typically, rate. And um, what we want to do is use this to, uh, to analyze our sample. So the first step is that we inject our sample um, from our vial onto the front of the column. And so the, the, the mobile phase flows through in one direction. And we have everything, uh, to a first approximation, sticking to the stationary phase, at least initially. Um, and the mobile phase uh, continues, or it flows through the column. Uh, we may do several things to get stuff to start to come off of this column, or the chromatographic term would be a loot. We might change the composition of the mobile phase. We might change the temperature of the column. We might change uh, um, uh, the flow rate under some, some less common circumstances. Uh, and as that happens, the differential affinity of these components of your sample um, start to show themselves. So uh, 
in the first step, we might have one uh, metabolite that moves quickly through the column and is uh, nearly immediately detected by your detector. And, and we'll talk about detector later. Um, and then that comes out the column as a peak. And then at that same point in time, your other metabolites have moved less far through the column. And we may continue to change the properties of the mobile phase so that, uh, say, if we're dealing with a more hydrophobic column, a, a metabolite that eventually will come off the column and give a second peak in your detector signal. And then finally, uh, we'll continue to change the mobile phase composition or the temperature and we'll get our third peak. And so that's, that's the way chromatography works in a very general sense. Um, you can spend easily a semester-long course talking about this. And so we're going to stop right there. Um, uh, the uh, the uh, output of chromatography is a chromatogram. Um, uh, you're probably going to encounter this at least in passing in, in dealing with metabolomics. Um, uh, just basically to define terms, uh, um, a chromatogram is a plot of retention time or intensity versus retention time. And as I just showed you, um, we, we had an example where we separated three things and got three peaks. Uh, real mixture is often going to be a lot more complicated. We have multiple peaks um, over the course of the retention times uh, um, in, in this and, and various different intensities. Some things are smaller, they give rise to smaller signals. Some things are bigger, they give rise to bigger signals. We may not have perfect uh, separation or perfect resolution of all the components. Um, so uh, that's, that's the output of, a, a, of chromatography. Okay, LC versus GC. Which one do we want to use? Well, we can help make that decision. We may, uh, you may tell us amino acids and we'll already know which is the best, me best method to use. Um, but if you are, as an analyst, an, uh, analyst, faced with that choice, you can choose between LC or GC. Um, LC separation, separates mole molecules or metabolites in solution. Um, it re relies on uh, interaction between the analyte and the stationary phase, as already described. And many different methods of separation, modes of separation, are possible. We'll talk about that in a future slide. Um, GC separates molecules in the gas phase. So uh, you have to make your metabolite or molecule of interest I uh, um, uh, go typically from the liquid phase uh, into the gas phase by heating it. Um, uh, chemical interactions, again, happen between the analyte and the stationary phase. Typically, the carrier gas, which is the analog to the mobile phase, is inert. It, it's not interacting that much. It just carries the gas phase metabolites that aren't retained by the column through. Um, elution order is typically determined mainly by boiling point or, or volatility. There's other factors that play in. Um, generally, as a, as a chromatographer, we say if you could use and it made no difference, either GC or LC. GC is usually simpler. It's often faster. It often gives higher resolution. So um, if you can choose GC, you often will. But um, I, that's a big caveat. GC doesn't work for all metabolites. LC is a little bit more universal. Um, so uh, so I, it often winds that LC, I would say, uh, you know, 60, 40 LC over GC, depending on the class of analytes that you're, um, that you're tending to, to look at. Um, here's a, a slide for your reference on, on some of the figures of merit of, of GC or LC. Um, uh, both can be high sensitivity. Both uh, can be good for quantitation if they're carefully manage, managed. Um, uh, GC, uh, I'm sorry, uh, um, uh, LC is the only one that's going to work with non-volatile compounds. Both can work uh, with volatile compounds. There's more matrix effects concerns. We won't get into that in, in gory detail. Um, in the in the LCMS, we just have to do our best job to, to manage those so that we get accurate quantitative data. Um, there's more modes of separation available on LC. Um, this has already been described in, in passing by a couple of our speakers today. Um, but you may hear, oh, you're going to submit samples. We're going to do a GCMS analysis. We need to derivatize them to make them a more amenable to GCNS, GCMS analysis. Um, so the idea here is we're taking a non-volatile metabolite, something that you couldn't put into the gas phase without it burning up. Um, I, most amino acids would be like that. If you tried to heat an amino acid to the point where it became a vapor, um, it would probably thermally degrade uh, before you got it in the gas phase. But if we chemically modify it um, with something that typically has uh, hydrophobic uh, um, properties, uh, we use a silating agent. Um, uh, uh, frequently, this is an example of methyl tertiary butyl um, silyl trifluoroacetamide, which is a derivatizing reagent that will uh, uh, replace active um, hydrogens on, say, oxygens and nitrogens with this bulky um, but nonpolar um, uh, derivatizing group. And believe it or not, uh, when you get your derivatized metabolite, this thing is, has a higher vapor pressure, um, easier to put in the gas phase, uh, makes uh, some metabolites that aren't volatile to begin with 
and amenable to GCMS analysis. But it does make the, the process more complicated. So we'll do it if we need to for GCMS. Um, another thing to mention about liquid chromatography, I mentioned that there are lots of different modes of separation. Um, we will choose or help you choose the best method I, um, I, for the analysis. But you may encounter these terms in terms of I, I reading metabolomic papers. Um, you may occasionally encounter normal phase liquid chromatography where your stationary phase is polar, um, uh, your, your mobile phase is, uh, is uh, nonpolar. It typically works for organic uh, solvent soluble lipids, um, but uh, you can't uh, have any water present in your sample. So it's not frequently used uh, for metabolomics. Reverse phase liquid chromatography, abbreviated RPLC, uses a nonpolar stationary phase, and it works best for nonpolar to semipolar metabolites in an aqueous or a mixed aqueous organic uh, sort of matrix. So this is this is fairly uh, fairly commonly used in metabolomics. Hydrophilic interaction chromatography is all, all also commonly used. It's fairly analogous to normal phase, except um, it allows addition of some water to your mobile phase uh, and to your sample uh, matrix. So it, it, it's more compatible with metabolomics. Good for polar metabolites. Um, there are other modes of uh, liquid chromatography you may encounter in literature, ion exchange, um, anion or cation exchange, ion pairing, um, size exclusion, uh, which separates uh, uh, metabolites or, or, uh, or larger molecules based on their size. Um, all of these things are, are, are things you may encounter in literature. Um, we will uh, pick, or at, at the least, uh, help you pick um, which method is going to be the best for the classes of metabolites. Okay, mass spectrometry. Um, I, so what does mass spectrometry involve? Uh, mass spec is a very useful, versatile technique. It, uh, it, uh, everything, every metabolite you measure has a characteristic mass or molecular weight. Um, so we can use that property to help distinguish between metabolites, relatively obviously. And that's, that's the, sort of the basis of mass spectrometry. But a key caveat is that mass spec detects any, any compound or metabolite that can form an ion. So what are we talking about an ion? Most metabolites, as they uh, as they exist um, in, in solution in, in, in the body or in, in cells, are neutral molecules or are, um, or are solvated. They're not uh, independent ions. So the process of mass, spe mass spectrometry requires that we convert a neutral metabolite into an ion. And we do that by a process called uh, ionization, not surprisingly. And there's a, a variety of different modes uh, of ionization that, that a particular instrument may use to form ions. Uh, the, the reason for pointing that out, though, is that um, not absolutely everything will form an ion under every mode of ionization. So if you have a carbohydrate, a very neutral molecule, you may have trouble ionizing it by uh, electrospray mass spectrometry um, uh, without some further tricks, uh, derivatization, alteration, alteration of the pH of the liquid. So um, uh, that's the first step in mass spectrometry is we convert our neutral metabolites um, uh, to ionized metabolites. And we also want to put them in the gas phase. So we need to, if, if they're in solution, we need to evaporate any solvent. Um, that's typically done as, uh, in, in, in GC, that's already done for you. All your metabolites are in the gas phase. Uh, in LC, we use heat and uh, uh, gas flow to do that. That's part of the ionization source taken care of by the instrument. Um, I, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but then the next stage, the key stage, is we want to separate them by mass. We want to be able to resolve something that has a molecular weight of 191 Daltons from something that has a molecular weight of 193 Daltons. And we want to be as specific as possible. We want to get an, as accurate as a mass as possible, um, all other things being equal, to be able to distinguish something with a closely, uh, with a similar molecular mass, but that uh, is still different from, say, another metabolite. Um, so uh, we'll use any of a variety of strategies to separate our ions that we formed by mass. And then we want to detect those ions and read them out in a way that, uh, that preserves the information, that we can tell what their masses are, and that gives us quantitation so that we get more signal for a more concentrated um, ion and less signal for a less, uh, a less abundant ion. Um, so MS is sensitive selective. It's, it's a high resolution method, and it can help identify metabolites because, as I said, everything has a mass, and it's a very useful property to help identify. It can also sometimes provide structural information beyond just that mass. Um, what what, do the, what does the, uh, the structure of that metabolite look like if you don't know? Uh, it's useful for quantitation, but sources of interference have to be carefully managed, and that's our job as the core lab, is to, uh, to help uh, um, uh, determine if there are any potential sources of interference, and there usually are, and then manage them, uh, typically by, uh, by cal careful calibration, by inclusion of internal standards, by quality control checks, uh, 
to know what the magnitude of any sources of interference are so that the data that you get out you can trust and at least uh, you know you know uh, to what extent you can trust it would we expect to be able to detect a 5% change a 50% change a 200% change in metabolite levels okay so the output just like I did with chromatography the output of mass spectrometry is called a mass spectrum you may encounter this in reading the literature uh, analogous to a chromatogram uh, it's a plot of intensity rather than retention time we have a plot of mass uh, really more specifically mass to charge ratio uh, we form ions ions can have a single charge which is the case with most metabolites or it can have multiple charges um, you can have a plus two a plus three ion uh, the, the output is is a, it actually in, in a mass spectrum is the mass to charge ratio sometimes re referred to as m over z um, so in a given compound you may might uh, in, in a given mass spectrum you may have multiple different peaks that come from multiple different metabolites may come from a reference signal so here we have a peak for a uh, metabolite and we have an internal reference um, uh, that is always present in all of our mass spectra that are acquired on a time of flight instrument we'll talk about that uh, which we use to calibrate to make sure that the mass that we measure is uh, as accurate as possible and we may have other metabolites here so we get two modes of resolution we get both uh, both separation by chromatography and by mass spectrometry okay very briefly um, forming an ion you may run into the term electrospray ionization this is what I would say is the dominant modes uh, method for forming ions in LCMS uh, um, that's used today for metabolomics um, uh, tip, you have your liquid containing your metabolites uh, flowing from your column this is after a separation has occurred we'll talk about that in a second um, and we need to evaporate the solvent and form ions so we use a nebulizing gas a heated nebulizing gas typically along with a drying gas to help remove this uh, the solvent we also apply an electrical potential um, uh, high voltage basically to this uh, to this droplet this is all done by the instrument which imparts a, uh, an abundance of charge on the liquid coming out of this capillary um, and in the process uh, of, uh, of uh, through the process of adding this nebulizing gas and applying the voltage droplets are formed those droplets reduce in size uh, um, over many successive uh, 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 steps of desolvation and fission and ultimately you are left with um, with unsolvated gas phase ions and we can produce ions from a wide range of things they can be very small metabolites um, amino acids uh, uh, um, uh, very small compounds even larger things can ionize um, uh, we typically don't look at proteins but proteomics works by uh, uh, using mass spectrometry works by very much the same me method and so ultimately we get uh, gas phase ions which are pulled into the mass spectrometer and then analyzed okay um, uh, well how do we do that uh, how do we analyze uh, things by their mass uh, this probably is maybe more technical uh, than 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 is of interest to most of you uh, but um, I, I find it interesting you may encounter these different uh, references to different types of mass analyzers so we'll spend just a minute or two describing how we would go from from a, a mixture of different ions of many different masses to uh, separated by mass uh, and being able to usefully detect them so uh, um, ions have to be manipulated under vacuum you'll find that out this afternoon we have vacuum pumps running in our instrument room all the time all, after you form the ions they need to be manipulated under vacuum um, uh, many different types of mass analyzers exist there's a lot of different solutions to this problem here are a list of, uh, of common mass analyzers that you may run across in the literature um, we have uh, we have at least two to three of these types of instruments in our facility um, quadrupole time of flight uh, um, and uh, other users have ion traps on uh, on campus uh, that we use occasionally uh, so basically they're all solving the same problem they just go about it different ways one that you may run into is a quadrupole um, your ions come in and quadrupole acts, acts like a mass filter it allows you to per, uh, pass a particular mass to charge ratio uh, at a time um, uh, by altering their uh, its trajectory in an electric field um, uh, and then you can scan the electrical potentials that you're applying to these uh, four poles to allow different masses to pass at different time if anyone's interested in this in more detail I can describe it um, uh, to the extent of my limited physics knowledge um, uh, really this uh, even to us analysts is is is, uh, is not something we have to interact with on a daily basis but um, the, the output of this type of instrument is relatively low mass accuracy we can resolve things that are one Dalton apart um, but not much better than that uh, but it's good for quantitation um, and it's good in that it can be used in parallel with other mass analyzers a time of flight mass analyzer is actually this is the sort of simplest to understand um, you put a bunch of ions in 
uh, you allow them, uh, accelerate them to the same kinetic energy, and you allow to, them to drift in a field-free um, region. And bigger things, because uh, um, K equals one half mv squared, uh, bigger things move slower. Uh, and so the small ions hit your detector first. Uh, uh, you time, you have effectively a very accurate stopwatch in your detector, um, and you say, how long did it take for my ions to get from a pulse here at the beginning of the flight tube to the end? Uh, you count when they arrive, and then that, that information gives you the mass. Um, it, believe it or not, it can actually be a fairly high, highly mass accurate instrument with appropriate calibration. It's a little more expensive as far as the equipment. Um, we have all of those, uh, 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 we have various types of instrumentation, so you don't have to worry about that cost. Um, it does require careful attention to calibration. Um, we use both methods. Um, tandem mass spectrometry is something you're probably going to run into uh, in, in, uh, in descriptions of, of uh, types of instruments and assays that are out there. Um, uh, tandem mass spectrometry is a, the, the idea is that we're going to, instead of just taking ions that are produced and figuring out what their masses are, we're going to do multiple stages of mass spectrometry uh, within a single instrument, within a single uh, analysis. So uh, as before, um, we're going to put ions into the instrument. We're going to say, for example, pick one particular ion of interest. Maybe we're really interested in identifying an ion with a molecular weight of 237 Daltons. So we select that ion, and then we, um, we expose it to some sort of a uh, collision-induced dissociation process. It may be a gas in a collision cell. Um, there's various other processes that can be used inside the instrument. And, uh, and uh, so that particular ion is selected by a first mass spectrometer here. I'm giving an example of a tandem quadrupole. So we use a first mass filter to select that ion. We use a, a collision cell, which could be a quadrupole or a hexapole. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but it's where that ion is broken up into multiple fragment ions. And then we get a spectrum of different fragment ions out. And we can use that spectrum to help identify. We can say, well, uh, we know that a particular uh, um, uh, type of uh, functional group will fragment to give a mass of a particular uh, uh, characteristic uh, product ion. And that's useful to identify the ion. We can also use it for quantitation. We can say we know uh, that a particular no known standard uh, has, a, uh, has a, uh, a parent mass or a, you know, a molecular ion mass of 191 Daltons. And it fragments to give a daughter ion of 111, ion, uh, 111 Daltons. And that is useful information for improving the selectivity for that particular ion, removing uh, possible other interferences that might have had a similar mass to the, to, the, to the starting ion. And then we can use that for quantitation. So um, a, a common instrument that you may hear of is a tandem quadrupole or a triple quad. Um, uh, this, this takes advantage of this property to uh, give enhanced selectivity and sensitivity, typically for targeted analyses. Usually, if we're doing tandem MS, uh, it limits the number of metabolites that we can monitor simultaneously. There are some ways around that if you want to do unbiased work on a, on a, on a um, tandem MS instrument. But often this is used for, for quantitation of targeted uh, metabolites. OK, briefly, why? OK, so let's put it all together. Why do we want to use a hyphenated technique? Why can't we just do LC or just do mass spec and call that good enough? Well, um, LC uh, um, uh, and GC are useful for separating complex mixtures. But um, A, they may not be enough to separate a complex mixture, like uh, uh, a sample uh, of plasma. You, you probably won't fully resolve all of your compounds uh, by LC. And also, it, with just the output of a chromatogram, it's difficult to identify um, what metabolite is what. Uh, mass spec can determine the, the, um, the mass of metabolites, and it's useful for identification. But if you put the entire metabolome into a mass spectrometer all at once, you're not going to be able to distinguish what all of them are. So um, when we put them together, when we run LC um, coupled to mass spec, we can do a better job with that. Um, and so this is just sort of a basic block diagram. I'll get the chance to show you this as, as well as Chunhai this afternoon in the demo. Um, but in LCMS, we have chromatography, which uh, consists of a pump, a, uh, a column, a, uh, um, a uh, means of injecting the sample onto the column. Uh, then we have an ion source where the ions are produced. So uh, the outlet of the column is coupled to the inlet of the mass spectrometer. We have the mass analyzer. This is a, a time of flight mass analyzer. I'll show you one that looks exactly like this upstairs. And then we have a detector contained with instrument and does uh, uh, data collection. Um, a GCMS looks very similar, uh, uh, not physically, but the, as far as a black diagram, we have chromatography. Um, it's a column inside an oven. We use temperature programming in GC, as Chun Hai will show you later this afternoon. Um, we do ionization inside the mass spectrometer. 
Um, we have a mass analyzer, a quadrupole typically, or, or, or a time of flight to separate ions by the mass, and then we have data collection. Okay, so that's hardware. Um, so if, if, uh, if that was not of interest, um, you, uh, 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 you may want to pay attention to, to the techniques because this will affect um, uh, uh, how you design your experiments. Um, so uh, this is a little bit of review from Sub's talk, uh, and we'll just sort of put a little bit of a different slant on it. Um, metabolomics approaches. Uh, as has already been mentioned, there's two basic uh, um, designs of an experiment. Uh, um, uh, you can do targeted, um, which is, uh, you know, in terse terms, if you know what you're looking for. If you know you want to measure amino acids in plasma because it's been published before and you, you want to, uh, uh, and you want to reproduce previous results and extend or have a different biological application, then that's a good place to start. Um, uh, and you can, uh, you can consult with the core and we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, either uh, use an existing assay uh, that we have up and running. We'll develop a new assay for you uh, if need be. Um, we'll, we can reproduce uh, other targeted metabolomic assays that are out there in literature. Typically targeted uh, metabolomics are useful for tens, maybe low hundreds, maybe, uh, maybe not uh, uh, in terms of number of compounds at once. There's nothing that stops you from doing multiple targeted analyses on a single sample. You may say, I want acylcarnitines, amino acids, and uh, TCA cycle metabolites on a given sample. And you may still have uh, the best way to go be to do three separate targeted assays rather than to move to an unbiased uh, um, uh, approach. Or it may not be, and we'll help you decide that. Um, in targeted, we get confident identities, which are based on authentic standards, and we can give you either absolute quantitation, uh, you know, micromolar, uh, um, or, you know, relative to tissue mass or, or any other uh, mode of absolute quantitation, or we can do relative quantitation, and sometimes that's good enough. Um, an example would be free fatty acid profiling of blood serum. Um, untargeted, uh, you know, a sort of a crude way of, of thinking about it is if you don't know what you're looking for, if you have an experimental design, you anticipate there may be effects on the metabolome, and you want an unbiased look, or I'm sorry, unbiased is the wrong term, if you want an overall look at, uh, at, at what, what may be going on in your sample, um, either in and of itself as a, as a final data output, or to help guide you in, uh, in future experiments, what, your, uh, what other targeted assays you may need to do, um, what sort of biomarker or potential biomarkers uh, might be present in your sample to, to do more investigation on. Um, it can look at, uh, or, I mean, so, so if you don't know what you're looking for, or if you want to look at everything as a first pass in order to help you guide uh, future experiments. Uh, it can work for up to thousands of compounds. Um, uh, some of those are going to be conf confidently identified. Some of them are going to be known unknowns. Some of them may be complete unknowns, uh, something that we've never seen before, although that's less common. Um, and the output, as, as, as many have already told you, is relative quantitation. And the example would be a global study of metabolic response to a change in diet. Uh, say you're doing a dietary intervention study, and you just want to know what happens uh, uh, in terms of metabolites, but you don't have, uh, you're, you're trying to generate hypotheses rather than test specific hypotheses, or uh, your, your hypotheses are multifaceted, and uh, you, uh, the data that you want um, is a multiple, uh, is, uh, is best served by this sort of approach. So just to look at workflow, I think Sue already covered this in a little bit of a detail. Um, the first step of any metabolomics experiment, including targeted, is sample preparation. Lee's already covered this in, in very good detail. Um, solvent extraction, uh, uh, you know, uh, sample, uh, sample prep, basically getting your samples ready to be put on the instrument. Then we do instrumental analysis, which I touched briefly on, and we'll talk, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll demonstrate for you in more detail later this afternoon um, by LCMS or GCMS or CEMS. Um, then we're going to get raw data out of that, um, and we'll go through a couple steps to get to the point where we do quantitation, typically involving peak integration. Um, uh, we'll use, uh, use standards to, do a, um, uh, to uh, determine the, uh, the calibr or to calibrate our data, uh, calibrate the instrument, um, uh, determine how much signal co corresponds to what concentration of analyte, and then we'll do data interpretation using statistics um, or whatever else is necessary. Uh, in untargeted men, uh, metabolomics, um, as has already been described in some level of detail, um, the sample preparation and instrumental analysis will be tailored to a more um, uh, general uh, uh, analysis of the, uh, of the samples, but um, uh, the, the basic idea is similar. Um, uh, instead of looking for targeted features, and Tanu and Sasha will tell you a lot more about this process um, than we have time to cover right here, but uh, instead of looking for specific things, we're going to look for everything that may be present in the sample. So we'll do feature detection, 
we'll try to find what features are in common between the samples so that we can quantitatively compare them. We may do recursive processing to help uh, find as many features as possible and make sure that the data is quantitatively as reliable as possible. We'll do data analysis. Often that'll start with some sort of uh, separation by, uh, by multi-scalar analyses, PCA. Um, uh, others will tell you more about this. Uh, feature identification is an important step. Uh, some compounds may be identified by virtue of their, um, of, uh, of our, their inclusion in our metabolite libraries. Um, some maybe are known unknowns where we see it re reproducibly and we can report uh, r relative changes. Um, and then we need to do more work if, if it's of interest uh, to identify them. Um, uh, some things may be true unknowns and, and, and if they're of interest we can do true, uh, um, uh, we, can, we can work more to help identify those compounds. And then further data analysis. Um, statistics, uh, pathway mapping, et cetera. Others will tell you a lot more about that. Okay, so let's give an example. I, I, like, to, I like to think in practical terms. Tanu will, will, uh, will also provide examples. Um, but uh, how do we go from what came out of the instrument, what I was showing you, the chromatogram, the mass spectrum, to useful data? Um, so the, the example that I'm going to give here is, uh, is a targeted study of acyl carnitines in blood ser serum, um, let's say, during exercise. Uh, so uh, acyl carnitines are, are a class of molecule that are, are used in energy transfer in mitochondria as well as other uh, various other functional roles. They can have a, a variety of different um, uh, characteristics. Uh, they can be, so the, the carnitine group is the common uh, head group of the carnitine. It can have either a short lipid chain uh, or, or even uh, no lipid chain, a, a short, uh, short chain um, acyl group or a long chain acyl group. Um, I, so here's acetyl carnitine and palmitoyl car carnitine. Um, uh, the, this, this, this ACL chain imparts different functional properties um, to the carnitine, um, but they're of interest in, in, uh, in, in understanding uh, metabolic processes that occur um, uh, uh, during, during, uh, during consumption of energy, during uh, determination of what fuel is being used uh, for exercise, for example, some related to my research. So um, we're going to use, uh, as an example, blood serum from resting and exercising rats. Um, and we're going to look at the levels of these different ACL carnitines. So the analytical method um, uh, we already touched on uh, uh, that we're going to choose, uh, what we have to select is sample preparation. In this case, we use pro protein precipitation by an organic solvent, which removes proteins while retaining uh, the, the solubility of the polar and moderately nonpolar carnitine species. Um, and then we'll include internal standards in that, in that extraction solvent so that we know um, uh, that through all the steps that we're going to carry the sample, um, if any matrix effects occur, if we have loss of uh, of our um, our uh, of any of any particular classes of acyl carnitines, we'll be able to quantify that, and we'll be able to use it as a quality control check. And then we'll use as our detection method, um, we'll use tandem quadrupole mass spectrometry, um, following a reverse phase LC separation. Um, okay, so uh, this would be the raw output if you were just to look at what came out of the instrument without any further analysis for um, this experiment. And we have what's called a total ion chromatogram, which means all signal from all of the ions that the mass spectrometer was able to perform uh, or, or to produce, and you get a plot of intensity versus retention time. So uh, many of these, of these peaks here are indeed acyl carnitines that we're interested in. Um, and this was a tandem quadrupole instrument. Uh, uh, so we had previously programmed the instrument to look specifically for um, uh, uh, the uh, acyl carnitine. And uh, so, so we have a relatively clean spectrum. We can, we can say that a lot of these peaks are indeed acyl carnitine. If we had a different type of analysis where we were doing more unbiased uh, uh, approach and we were attempting to detect all the ions, then uh, we might have a more complex chromatogram. But even so, this is moderately complex. We just have peaks. We don't know what they are yet. Um, uh, we have some that are incompletely resolved. Uh, so we need, to, we need to do more work to go from this, this point of the data to actually useful information. So the first step is to generate extracted ion chromatograms. So this is more terminology that you may bump into. Um, ex extracted ion chromatograms are where you take the total signal and you say, I want to look at signal that only comes from a particular ion, say a mass to charge of 204, which happens to be the mass of, uh, of uh, acetyl carnitine. And then, I'm sorry, this is an error in my, in, my, in my typing. This would be a different mass here. Um, different, different carnitines will have different masses. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and we'll have uh, different mass to charge ratios that appear at, at, different, um, at, at different retention times on the column. So you can see here we have, uh, we have specificity not only by the mass to charge ratio, but also by the retention time. And the next step following that is to 
um, do something to quantity. So uh, typically we look at the area under the curve or the integrated peak area uh, as, as our final quantity or as, as our preliminary quantitative readout. Um, and that's going to be what is used then to, uh, to, to do the further quantitation step. So we measure the peak area um, for all of our metabolites. And then we use, um, we use quantitation by a reference to a calibration curve. So uh, previously we've injected uh, samples of known concentrations. Um, I, that, that encompass the, the range of concentrations that we expect to find in a biological sample. Uh, not too different from when you do any other sort of an assay, like a glucose assay or a lactate assay. It's just that we have uh, prepared it in advance for as many metabolites as we hope to measure. Uh, and we are using an internal standard to compensate for, uh, for um, matrix effects uh, uh, that may alter the quantitation uh, depending on what other uh, uh, not of interest metabolites are present in your sample. Um, this is what this looks like for a targeted analysis. We have uh, software which aids us in this process of generating calibration curve, ratioing the peak area of your, um, your metabolite to that of the internal standard, uh, generating uh, and, then, and then finding where your, your compound falls on this calibration curve in order to measure a concentration. Uh, so that's a, a very crude uh, work for those of you who have done quantitation uh, by other methods. This is, this is probably not unfamiliar to you. Um, the, 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 the trick comes in selecting appropriate internal standards and uh, validating the quantitation uh, and the recovery um, uh, before you begin your assay. And then uh, the output um, comes uh, in targeted metabolomics can be as simple as bar graphs showing changes under the different conditions. It can be um, heat maps, which uh, are, are good at displaying a, a, a wider variety of changes. It can be a principal component analysis for unbiased work. Uh, uh, it, can be, uh, it can be pathway mapping. Um, so others will tell you a lot more about this process. And so there's going to be a lot more on that in uh, this afternoon and tomorrow's talk. OK, so we're going to spend the last uh, 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 10 or so uh, minutes talking about fluxomics. Um, uh, conventional metabolomics is in concept relatively straightforward. So the idea is you're trying to measure uh, the concentration or the total amount of small molecule compounds in your sample. Uh, so that's not too different from what you might do if you were running a, 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 um, you know, a, a biological assay for glucose. Uh, fluxomics, uh, or attempting to measure metabolic flux, is something that's a lot more challenging to do by other methods. So um, uh, the, just to sort of define what's going on, um, the rate of turnover of metabolites is, a, uh, is an important metric that you may not be able to access just by looking at metabolite concentrations. Um, so this is a, a sort of a growing field of interest. Um, you, uh, the, the use of metabolomics and metabolomics methods to help uh, understand rates of turnover of metabolites. And, and that may give you additional information that you may not be able to access from just, as I mentioned, metabolite concentration. So let's, let's look at that in terms of an analogy. What is metabolic flux, um, if you haven't thought about it? And, and uh, this is, a, is, a, is a, a, a slide that I lifted from the web, um, so I acknowledge the contribution uh, from this individual. Uh, it, not my idea to use it as an analogy, but um, I think it's, it's effective in a sort of a corny way of describing what flux is. So if, if you think of your metabolite uh, concentrations or your metabolite pools um, as what we're able to measure with conventional metabolomics, those are, uh, you know, the, the, the size of a body of water in a river. Say, uh, say uh, you know, uh, before and after a waterfall and in, perhaps in the middle of the waterfall we have this little pool. That's representative of your metabolite concentrations or total amount. The, the flux is the rate of flow into and out of um, these metabolite pools. And that's reflected by the, the rate of flow of water uh, from upstream to downstream. And so you have source fluxes, something, if this is your metabolite pool of interest, you have uh, 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 me metabolism is, is a very dynamic process, as you, as you well know. You have uh, one or maybe several uh, potential uh, metabolites that feed in uh, to a metabolite pool, and all of those things may have separate source fluxes. And then you have the flow out of, uh, of that, of that uh, pool into sink fluxes. And so the, the key thing to notice here is that the the amount flowing into the pool, by nature, has to be the amount flowing out of the pool. Uh, otherwise, um, the pool is growing or shrinking, which could be happening. Um, uh, the direction of, uh, of, of flow, in this case, is determined by gravity and metabolomics. It's a little bit more complicated. You can get flow in both directions, so it's, the, the analogy doesn't hold up perfectly. But a key, key thing is that the size of the pool 
is independent of the amount of flow into or out of the pool. You could have a tiny trickle and a very large intermediate pool, or you could have a, a very tiny pool, um, and you could have a, a huge flow into and out of it. And, uh, and, and uh, both of those things, the pool size and the, and the rate of flow, are useful pieces of information. So how are we going to address that? How are we going to figure out what this flux is? Uh, so this has been alluded to by, by various other speakers. We'll go in a little bit more detail right now. Um, so let's use the TCA cycle, sort of central carbon metabolism, uh, you, you, uh, something most everyone has encountered and is probably of interest uh, uh, to a large number of investigators. Um, as, as an example, uh, not as the only thing that, that you might be interested in, but as an example of where you might want to measure metabolic flux. Uh, so this is, this is a, a picture of the, of the uh, TCA cycle. Um, we have uh, glucose as, a, as, a, as one possible starting substrate that goes through glycolysis, multiple steps to form pyruvate, uh, and enters into the TCA cycle through uh, acetyl-CoA. Um, and uh, the TCA cycle is, is, is not simply a cycle. Uh, it does more than just turn arounds. It's sort of uh, uh, turns and turns. It, it provides substrates for uh, other synthesis of metabolic intermediates. Um, it, uh, TCA cycle metabolites can be consumed and produced by a variety of processes. So it's not as simple as this, but we'll focus in on this. So how would we go about measuring rates of turnover of metabolites? Well, we have to do something uh, in order to be able to see it, right? So going back to our, our previous, uh, 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 but all we're able to really measure is the, uh, we can't physically measure flow of metabolites. We need something that will give us information about it. So going back to our previous analysis, you can think about it putting dye in the river and watching how long it takes for your pools to become colored. Well, here what we're going to do is we're going to use a stable isotope, um, I, which is effectively dyed in terms of mass spectrometry. We can distinguish the difference between uh, uh, conventionally, uh, or the, the most abundant isotope of carbon in nature, which is carbon-12, and uh, another stable isotope of carbon, which is carbon-13, by mass spectrometry. If we put labeled glucose into this, uh, into this, uh, this sample, uh, say labeled with carbon-13, and then, uh, and then uh, put that, we exposed a cell to that, and then uh, gave it some period of time to incorporate that labeled glucose into the uh, metabolic intermediates, then we might see something like this happening. Okay, so the first step, uh, glucose will form fully labeled pyruvate, which will form fully labeled acetyl-CoA. And so two carbons from acetyl-CoA uh, become incorporated into citrate by condensation with unlabeled oxaloacetate in the first step of the TCA cycle to give you a two-carbon labeled metabolite. So we can now detect how much of this two-carbon labeled citrate is present relative to the other isotopes of carbon. And then that follows through the whole rest of the TCA cycle. If we gave the cells more time, um, then uh, so then let's, let's say, okay, this is what happened in the first turn of the TCA cycle. We have our two labeled carbons. If we gave them more time, kept incorporating more labeled acetyl-CoA, we would eventually see incorporation of two additional carbons into citrate. We would lose some carbons to carbon dioxide, which is what the TCA cycle does. We would get uh, a more complex labeling pattern. We would get multiple different levels of labeling in our TCA cycle intermediate. And um, we can look at the pattern of labeling over time as a means of assessing rates of flux. So how do you do this? Um, in, 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 uh, uh, so that's a, a complicated question. And again, I would reemphasize uh, the, the previous emphasis that has already been placed. Is if you're interested in the flux experiment, come to talk to us. We can tell you about uh, the various different types of tracers that are available, the various different types of analyses that are available, um, uh, and the, the various ins and outs of doing the experiment. Um, uh, and, and this is a growing, and, a, a rapidly growing and evolving field um, uh, on the cutting edge of a lot of research. So um, what may be available right now may change two years from now. Um, uh, it's not a new concept, but certainly the, the tools that are available now um, are, 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 uh, are, are much greater than they were 10 years ago. So um, we can do a lot more than were, was possible in the past. So let's think about it in cell culture, probably the easiest way to do a flux experiment. Um, I, there are other ways you could think about doing this in, in animals or in humans under much more limited and specific experiments, although it becomes much more complicated, much more challenging. And, and uh, you know, if you want to go down that road, that's going to require extensive consultation and, and may or may not be possible at the present time. But in cell culture, let's say we took unlabeled cultured cells and we exchanged or spiked into their media a, a, a substrate that they can metabolize containing a C C13 tracer. Say, 13C glucose, uniformly labeled, would be one option. You can use other tracers. You could use labeled lipids, labeled amino acids. Uh, a, a variety of things are possible. 
and then you you uh, you you allow those cells to be exposed to the labeled tracer for various periods of time, say 30 minutes and 120 minutes. Then you harvest the cells at various different points along a long time following uh, exposure to this labeled tracer, and then we go through our conventional, essentially conventional um, uh, uh, metabolomics experiment, and we do L LCMS and GCMS analysis. What do we get out of that? Okay, well. Um, I, if we were to look, just focusing in on one metabolite, let's look at fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, which is a, a glycolysis intermediate. Um, this is what it might look like as far as a mass spectrum um, I, in, I, in, in, a, in cells that have not yet been exposed to any stable isotope tracer after 60 minutes. We get basically a single peak um, with a little bit of natural isotope abundance. That's one caveat. Um, uh, 13C is at about 1.1% 1 1, 1 .1 abundance in nature. And when you have a multiple carbon-containing molecule, um, we have uh, we have a little bit more abundance, so we see some other peaks, but essentially all of the uh, all of the metabolite is con contained in a single mass. At, at uh, this is negative ion mode, so we lose a proton. So uh, a 340 Dalton metabolite shows up at a mass of roughly 339 Daltons. After 60 minutes exposure to 13C glucose, we have a little bit of it left, but almost all of it has transitioned over to the six carbon labeled um, uh, fructose 6 bisphosphate. So we have fully labeled um, uh, uh, um, 13C, thir fully 13C labeled fructose bisphosphate. If we looked at earlier time points, we might have seen that transition. Um, we might see, uh, and we might be able to assess how long, how rapidly that pool is turning over. Um, let's look at citric acid, a TCA cycle intermediate. Well, at at, uh, at, uh, at time zero, uh, we have again a single peak, effectively aside from the natural abundance uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, citric acid at the unlabeled mass. After 60 minutes exposure, um, we still see some of that unlabeled citrate, but we now see a distribution of different isotopes up to 197 Daltons, which will be fully labeled, six carbon labeled citrate. So at various different time points, we can, uh, we can see various different levels of labeling. Um, and this is what that looks like. Um, so at 10 minutes, we see, uh, we see a substantial portion of uh, remaining unlabeled metabolite. We see um, predominantly of the labeled metabolite that's been formed, we see predominantly 13C2, which if you go back to look at the TCA cycle makes sense because the first step in, in synthesis of citrate in the TCA cycle is incorporation of two carbons from acetyl-CoA. So it makes sense that early, uh, at early time points, the, the labeled form of citrate that we have is, uh, is predominantly 13C2. As more time passes, we see uh, evidence of increasing turns of the TCA cycle formation of Multiple, uh, um, uh, multiple different forms of labeled citrate, and we see uh, increasing abundance of these higher labeled forms, uh, decreasing abundance as time passes of the unlabeled citrate and of your 13C2 citrate. So this, uh, measuring the difference between these time points, and then to take it a step further, comparing differences in time points between, say, a control sample and an experimental sample is how you can go about, to a first approximation, measuring metabolic flux and getting some idea. So it's complicated. Um, one thing to say, I, I already alluded to natural isotopic abundance. Um, carbon-13 is present in nature, about 1.1% of all carbon atoms in your body and in every organic uh, molecule are carbon-13. Um, this will affect the uh, natural isotope distribution. If you have a, a molecule that only contained a single carbon, you would expect its 13C1 peak, meaning a single carbon labeled, to be 1.1%. Uh, but if you have a carbon containing 20 carbons, for example, like nicotinamide, adenine dinucleotide, you see a substantial uh, uh, probability uh, that you're going to have at least one carbon-13 in the molecule. So this is the, 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 the um, uh, NAD after no exposure to any 13C substrate. We have a lot of 13C1. And then, you know, after time, we do see incorporation to other forms. Uh, but this will confuse your interpretation of the data um, unless we do something about it. So um, the core lab will, will, for you, if you're doing a flux experiment, do natural isotope abundance correction. So this is the same data, um, except for clarity shown now without the unlabeled carbon. Um, so we have a lot of the 13C1. This is your, your natural abundance and a bit of 13C2 in the, in the data, even at time zero. After we use our computational algorithms um, uh, to correct for the nat this natural isotopic abundance, we see no labeling. Uh, we see no labeling at our time zero, so it's uh, the, the natural isotopic abundance has been removed, and we can look at only the, the, the new labeling that is present in the data. So when you do a flux experiment, the data that you get out is going to be natural isotopic abundance corrected. Um, just to say that this is something that can be done. Um, I, I, 
there is the possibility of beyond doing these simple experiments saying comparing relative rates of flux of looking at uh, or attempting to actually quantitate absolute rates of flux. Um, this is something that is computationally intensive and uh, is only as good as the data that you put in and the assumptions that you make. Uh, really at, at this stage, um, uh, there are uh, research groups that are exclusively dedicated to figuring out what is the right way to do these types of experiments. So um, this is an evolving field. Um, I, if, if it becomes necessary for you to measure absolute rates of flux, it's something that we may be able to put you in contact with resources. We may be able to help work with you um, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to measure absolute rates of flux. But um, I want you to understand that this is, this is a complicated process. And uh, it's not something that may be uh, you know, routinely deliverable that we'll be able to report that the rate of conversion from uh, hexosphosphate to fructose bisphosphate is uh, uh, 0.7 moles per minute per gram of tissue. That would be the ultimate goal, uh, but uh, most of the data that we generate at this time is used for comparing relative rates of flux. But um, the, the idea behind this is you would measure as many metabolites as you can, define your input parameters, attempt to solve a model of the metabolic networks comp computationally, observe the off output, refine the model, and then ultimately uh, generate accepted uh, flux data. Um, so uh, that brings me to the end of my talk. I know that's a lot uh, of, of ground in an hour to cover. Uh, but uh, uh, we'll talk, uh, so, so hopefully I showed that, that combining a separation technique like LC or GC and mass spec really does offer a pretty powerful and universal way of, uh, of, of, of detecting metabolites. There are, uh, there are certainly caveats uh, to look at, and we as a core lab do our best job to manage those and produce data that's useful to you um, so that you don't have to worry about all of those things. Um, but it's good for you to be aware of them. Um, we use multiple instruments um, and try to pick the best analytical method to enable a comprehensive study of the metabolome or whatever portion of the metabolome that you're interested in. Um, it can be done using either targeted or tar untargeted approaches, or often untargeted will inform an, a targeted experiment or the other way around. And fluxomics is, is the process of using stable isotopes. I should point, these are non-radioactive isotopes. A lot of times other biological experiments are being done with radioactive isotopes. Um, this is the analog where we can get away with using uh, non-radioactive isotopes, it opens up a lot of uh, experiments that are not otherwise possible um, to study the rate of turnover of metabolite pools in biological samples. And uh, that's all I've got, so I'm happy with what limited time remains to answer any questions. So the first slide is to show us how to do comments. Which part do we do and which part do we Right. Do? Great, great <laughs> question. Great question. So you are going to be involved. So, so again, I will emphasize, especially for fluxomics, talk to us. The, that, that's right. The, uh, the, where that transition happens is going to be dependent on the particular experiment. Chances are, the first time you do this experiment, you're going to want to come to uh, either, either get uh, you know, intensively familiar with the process by consulting with us and talking through it, or you're going to want to work with us in our lab uh, um, I, to, 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 to understand the right way to handle the cells, to, to, to give them the tracer. You're probably going to want to talk to us to see, uh, you know, we have, we have limited quantities of these stable isotope tracers that we can, uh, we can give to you. And, and uh, you know, in, in small scale experiments, they're not that expensive. For larger experiments, you'll want to know what to buy and where to go to buy them. Um, but once you become familiar with the process, and we'll work with you with that, um, uh, and you're just doing repeated experiments, you can manage up to this point right here. Um, uh, so you're going to expose them to your stable isotope la uh, labels. There's no hazards in working with these above any other media, so you don't have to worry about radioactivity. Um, I, I, you, you can, uh, so you'll be able to manage up to this point um, uh, quenching metabolism in your cells uh, and collecting the samples, and then you'll submit them to us. And we're going to take them and do the metabolomics. Um, we're going to produce the data, and we're going to produce output, which will show you the relative extent of incorporation of isotopes into the experiment. And then we'll help you interpret what that means as far as, as, far as rates of flux. For a lot of these experiments, we've gotten to uh, experience a, a lot of different cell types, both adherent and and, and cell suspension. And actually, we've begun now some in vivo experiments, both in animals and humans. So we have an idea of what's going on. But I think you, you should know that you, you should expect to do some preliminary experiments just to see how fast metabolism is going on in your cells under the specific conditions that you're going to choose. 
because we don't want to say do a 60 minute experiment and you're at isotopic equilibrium all across, or you want to do a five minute experiment and you get very little label that we incorporated in. So uh, unfortunately, some of this is going to be uh, you know, experiments, and that's why we call it experiments. Uh, but some of the cells, I think we have a pretty good idea where we're going to be able to give you a pretty good idea of what might work for some initial experiments uh, to do it. And then it also depends upon what you're really trying to label. If you're trying to label like lytic intermediates, you know, seconds is probably long enough. Two minutes is long enough. If you're trying to get labeled into, you know, purine pathways or things like that, it's going to take longer to label up. So this is why you really need to talk to us about, you know, and, and if specific, we can get an idea of what you understand is specific metabolism in your cells and what we are experienced, we should be able to help you with that. So Charles, so just as you know better than I do, so you know a lot of people want to know so how much is you know to do you know let's say 20 dishes of, uh, of that with glucose metabolism. How much is you know C13 glucose or, or cost? Sure. So the cost of C13 glucose is actually pretty minimal. Um, uh, we can buy a gram of C13 glucose for uh, just under $100. Uh, so uh, you know when you're talking about 25 to f 5 to 25 millimolar in cell culture experiments and you're using uniformly labeled glucose, you don't, don't worry about it. Uh, it'll be a very small cost relative to your experiment. If you're thinking about doing other tracers, um, uh, things more comp uh, like lipids, uh, um, uh, so, so I mean, yeah, you're, you're going to talk a few dollars worth of isotope for that sort of an experiment, that's all. Um, uh, if you're thinking about uh, tracers like glutamine, you, uh, you can think, uh, uh, you know, um, tens to low hundreds of dollars for experiment. If you're thinking about doing this in animals uh, um, or in humans, uh, the, the, you, where you need grams and grams of this stuff, the costs go up substantially. So if you're talking about uh, trials of exercise on a, on a bike where you're infusing a stable isotope tracer, it's a substantial cost and it needs to be budgeted into your experiment from the beginning. Um, first come to talk to us. There's, uh, there's people who can help with those sort of experiments. You may or may not even want to go down that road. But uh, you know, for, for cell culture experiments, um, you know, it, it's not a zero cost, but it's not untenable um, for, for most tracers you're going to want to use. 